Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for March 25th, 2024. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim, and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. Uh, if you um, are new and you don't know what CircuitPython is, it is a version of Python that's designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting does get hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically occurs uh, on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. U.S. Pacific Time, except when that coincides with the U.S. holiday. Uh, and in that case, typically it will get moved uh, to the Tuesday or uh, rarely uh, on occasion it will be skipped. But the uh, calendar, which is linked in the notes doc, contains all of those details. So if you would like to add that to your calendar app, or download it to your desktop, you can do so using the calendar link that is in the notes doc. Uh, and the other thing that we do is whenever there is a change to the upcoming date or time, we will send out a ping over in Discord to the CircuitPythonistas role. So if you've got that role, then you'll get a uh, ping in Discord whenever we change the date or time. There is a notes doc that accompanies the meeting and recording. You can contribute to the document beforehand. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video, so you can skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting typic uh, typically runs about 30 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we'll post a link to the next meeting's notes doc to the CircuitPython dev channel over on Discord. You can always check the pinned messages there throughout the week to find the latest notes doc, and you uh, are totally free to add your notes at any point throughout the week once uh, that doc has been uh, created and pinned. If you wish to participate but can't attend, uh, that's no problem. You can leave hug reports and status updates in that document, and the host will read them for you during the meeting. Um, the meeting is held in five parts. The first part will be community news. That's a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware. Uh, that's a, a, a sneak peek, or it's no longer a sneak peek, but it's a, a couple items from that day's newsletter, which now goes out on Mondays. So we'll talk about a couple of items that were pulled from there. Uh, the next part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. That one is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from our status updates. The third part in the first of our two round robins is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things that folks are doing. Can take a moment to recognize awesome folks in our community and beyond. Uh, the fourth part is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to report on what you've been up to. Can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing in the last week since the last meeting and what you plan to do over the next week until the next meeting. The fifth and final part is In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for some more long-form discussions. Those can be discussions that come out of status updates or have uh, topics identified ahead of time and put into the notes doc. So if you uh, have something that you would like to discuss or think of something throughout the meeting that you'd like to discuss, uh, feel free to go ahead and scroll all the way down and throw that topic down in the uh, Weeds section of the notes. And then once it comes time for it at the end of the meeting, we'll read off those topics and go around uh, to discuss them. So with that, I will get our first timestamp and we'll take a look at the community news for the week. Uh, this week, um, CircuitPython 9.0.0 was released. CircuitPython 9.0.0 is the latest major re revision of CircuitPython. Now is the new stable release. Uh, you can check out all the new features and there are links here to the Adafruit blog as well as the release notes on GitHub, and it looks like a post that was uh, covering this fact on Tom's hardware. So check that out uh, if you would like to learn more. I think there were a couple items mentioned last week, so I didn't um, get out the bulleted list of anything, but the release notes will contain those details for anyone who is interested. Next up, uh, MicroPython plans a new feature for the Raspberry Pi RP2040, which is going to be runtime def defined USB device support. Uh, MicroPython is planning this new feature for the Raspberry Pi RP2040, runtime defined USB device support. It's expected to land in 1.23, and there are uh, links here to Hackster.io and the documentation. Uh, worth noting, it's very, very early stages, and it's uh, relatively low level from what I understand. You need to have some knowledge 
of the inner workings of USB most likely. Um, so this is not like a high level, easy to use thing, but it's really, really cool to see uh, that coming to MicroPython and then uh, you know, ultimately potentially having a chance to come into CircuitPython further down the line. Um, next up, the project of the week this week was a uh, desktop lunar display. Uh, Loran Underwood completes her desktop lunar display, which uses a Raspberry Pi Pico W programmed in MicroPython. There are some links here to uh, Element 14, um, Raspberry Pi, I guess probably just raspberrypi.org or something, yep, uh, YouTube and GitHub, so check that out. And uh, I grabbed this one. There are pictures of it in the uh, newsletter. I did not copy those over to the notes, but if you haven't seen this, um, do check out the newsletter, uh, and in particular the video as well over on YouTube. This is a really, really cool project that visualizes um, the phases of the moon using an actual... Um, I think it's 3D printed, or if not, just built up, you know, craft style uh, moon piece, and then a light behind it that kind of rotates to show you um, the size of the moon. I thought it was a really, really cool project. So check that out if you haven't seen it, if you didn't catch it in the newsletter. Uh, and then uh, the last of the newsletter items for today that caught my eye was a UC8151 uh, MicroPython driver. This is a MicroPython driver for the Badger 2040 e-ink display. Um, the, this is a, a new driver that was released. There are links to GitHub uh, to the driver directly as well as a post on Twitter. Uh, about it. And the uh, really, really cool thing about this one that caught my eye is this driver supports 32 levels of gray. So you can actually achieve some really amazing kind of photorealistic style stuff. Obviously, it's uh, still limited to some extent, but you can achieve some really neat looking uh, effects. There is a picture here that I clipped from the GitHub, I believe it was, showing an example of uh, a black and white photo that just looks really great for, uh, for an e-ink screen, definitely. So um, that's super exciting as well. So all of these items have been from the Python on Microcontrollers weekly newsletter, which is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter that gets emailed out every Monday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com. Uh, it highlights the latest in Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or projects, uh, edit next week's draft on GitHub. There is a link in the notes doc to that. You can submit a pull request with your changes, uh, or if you would like, you can also email to cpnews at adafruit.com or tag a post with hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon, Blue Sky, or Twitter, uh, now known as X. Um, thanks, uh, as always, to Anne, of course, for all the wonderful items that come to us each week in the newsletter. All right, so let's get the next timestamp. And next up is going to be the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Uh, this section is a quantitative overview of the entire project. Gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from our status updates. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core, the libraries, and Blinka. So first up are the overall stats for the week. Um, overall this week, we had 37 pull requests merged uh, by 15 authors, which is great to see. However, uh, I will admit I forgot to go through and bold the names. So off the top of my head here, the names that are uh, a little bit newer or less, uh, less recognizable, less frequent, uh, less frequently popping up, uh, at least to my eye, are uh, Jay Kittner uh, and... Um, is it uh, probably, well, I don't know if it's a capital I or a lowercase L, but it's uh, maybe IFF5 or LFF5 uh, over on GitHub. So thanks to those folks who, again, are perhaps newer or less frequent contributors or just uh, names that I don't quite recognize as much. Um, thank you to the rest of the folks as well who do have names that are a little bit more familiar uh, popping up in GitHub, again, at least to my eye. Um, there were five reviewers uh, for those 37 pull requests, so thanks to our reviewers. It is uh, mostly the usual folks, so uh, thanks as uh, usual, or uh, you know, thanks um, uh, as usual to Scott, Melissa, Tectric, Dan, and myself. Uh, as always, you know, we always like to say it during this section, the more reviewers we can get, the more contributors we can support. So if you would like to get involved, uh, reviewing is definitely one of the best things you can do. One of the things that can um, really, really help out the project overall to get more contributors able to contribute. Um, 
There were 27 closed issues by nine people with another 23 issues opened up by 20 people. So we are net down a little bit on the issue side. And that is it for the overall section. So with that, I will uh, ask if Scott, are you available to tell us about the core this week? I am, yep. And 20 people opening issues seems kind of high to me, which is awesome. Um, okay, so for the core, we had eight pull requests merged from seven different authors. Uh, Kibi Sriram is a new contributor uh, along with C. Darius, uh, so thanks to them. We had two reviewers, myself and Dan. We have 23 open pull requests, so we're comfortably, well, we're under the 25 mark, which is like for more than one page. Uh, Issues-wise for the core, we had six closed issues by two people and nine open by eight people. That's probably... A little bit more than normal, uh, but due to not too bad considering we just did 9.0 stable. We have uh, 665 open issues. Uh, we have three open issues for 9.0x, which is the kind of like the next stable patch release, um, kind of the most urgent thing. And then we have two open issues for 9.1.0, which will be the next feature version. So yeah, it's like major feature patch version for the different numbers. Um, and we had three issues not assigned to milestone, so we'll need to make sure and triage those if we haven't already. Um, nine put those out. Yay. <laughs> um, and that's it for the core. All right. Thanks, you. Thanks, Scott. Uh, next up is the section covering the libraries. So this covers all the CircuitPython libraries, which are Python-level code that uh, typically fall into one of two sort of overall umbrellas, uh, either driver libraries that interface with some specific piece of hardware or helper libraries that are just higher-level libraries that allow you to create your project without worrying about as many of the minute details involved uh, in some of the stuff we do. Uh, all these libraries can be found on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then the name of whatever library it is. So across all those libraries this week, we had 23 pull requests merged by eight authors. Uh, a couple of the names that stuck out to me as newer, uh, Jay Kittner, I think I mentioned before, but I also wanted to say thanks uh, this week to Skur. Um, Skur is a uh, longtime community member that pops up with hardware and stuff like that. Uh, quite a bit, but it is a little bit more rare to see them on the uh, the GitHub, so that's really cool to see. Thank you to Skur. Um, the, uh, so that was eight authors for our 23 pull requests. Uh, there were four reviewers, which again are mostly the usual folks, so thank you to our reviewers this week. Um, of the 23 pull requests that were merged, the oldest one was almost 300 days old, so uh, got one of the older ones in this week. The rest, uh, there was a handful that were about three weeks old, and then the rest are one to three days, so mostly newer after that. Uh, that leaves us after the week with 62 open pull requests, the oldest of which I believe is a draft. It's 585 days, the newest is uh, only one day. And um, over the past seven days, we had 16 issues closed by nine people with nine new issues opened up by eight people. Uh, so net down a little bit on issues in the libraries. That leaves us with 737 open issues. And of those, there are uh, 18 of them that are labeled good first issue, which you can find over on circuitpython.org slash contributing. Uh, before I tell you about that, I will mention too, I did uh, see ahead in the weeds section, there's some discussion on this. So if you're interested in these good first issue ones, you might stick around uh, to listen to the weeds discussion today. But let me tell you uh, about circuitpython.org slash contributing now. So uh, if you are interested Interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, uh, head over to circuitpython.org slash contributing. There you're going to find a list of open PRs and open issues. If you're looking to contribute, that's a great place to start. If you are interested in reviewing, check out the list of open PRs. Take a look at the code for the PR. If you've got the hardware for it, go ahead and give it a try. Uh, otherwise, just look for the syntax and spelling, etc. You can leave a comment over on GitHub letting us know uh, that you have looked at it. And once you're comfortable with doing that, we can get you leveled up to the review team. So you can leave official reviews over on uh, GitHub, uh, although comments are appreciated just as much. Uh, if you are interested in actually uh, getting your hands dirty, contributing some code or documentation, you can head over to check on the open issues. Uh, there is a drop down at the top of the page that you can use to sort by the labels on those, which is how you can find those good first issue uh, items. Those ones are intended to be items that are good for folks who don't have as much experience, uh, maybe haven't contributed to CircuitPython or any Python projects before. So these are identified as, um, you know, hopefully not requiring as much in-depth prior knowledge. 
Um, so those are good for that. And if you do find yourself wanting to contribute but uh, are having trouble with some step or don't know what to do next, uh, we do have guides covering the process of contributing with Git and GitHub. Also, we have loads of folks on the Discord who are available and more than willing to help you out. So if you are trying to contribute and having trouble, check out the guides, join us on Discord, uh, ask questions. Um, there's going to be folks who are more than happy to help uh, help you be able to contribute no matter what skill set you've got. So thanks as always to everyone who does that. Uh, in library PyPI stats for the week, um, we've got, let's see, one, uh, 136,279 PyPI downloads across the 325 libraries. And the top 10 list is listed here in uh, the notes doc. Uh, one thing uh, interesting to note, Connection Manager has actually cracked the top 10 already. So that's really cool to see a relatively brand new library up there. Um, the uh, list of libraries that are updated or new in the last seven days is also here in the notes doc. I'll call out the uh, ICE Python library over in the community bundle. That's a new uh, library for interacting with some, uh, I believe, FPGA types of hardware. I'm not 100% certain though, um, but it looked pretty cool to me. And then uh, update wise, we've got GPS RSA and uh, it looks like another uh, hardware driver for the AT42 QT that was updated. Uh, with that, I will send it over to Melissa to tell us about Blinka. Hello, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for uh, MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had six pull requests merged by four authors and four reviewers. Um, there are currently six open pull requests amongst all the repositories. There were five closed issues by two people and five open by five people, leaving a net of 86 open issues. There, are, there were um, 17,567 PyPI downloads in the last week, 12,271 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 132 supported boards. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Melissa. And... Next up is our Hug Reports section. So Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically uh, as they appear in the notes doc to give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or you're missing the meeting, I'll read your notes uh, when we get to you in the list. Otherwise, I'll call on you and you can read them aloud here in the Discord. Uh, so I will get us started once I take a timestamp. Uh, there we go. Uh, hug reports for me this week. Thank you to uh, Kevin T on Discord for helping folks out in the help with CircuitPython channel. Uh, thanks to DJ Devin3 uh, also for answering questions, helping people, and uh, even going so far as to reproduce issues that are brought up over in the Discord. Uh, all very much appreciated. Um, thanks to TechTrick for reviewing some, uh, I should say, a handful of CircuitP instruction readme fixes uh, over the past couple of weeks. Really appreciate that. Um, thanks to Justin uh, this week for trying out the um, uh, the effort to switch the libraries over to Rough and submitting some PRs with the initial changes for that. I really appreciate uh, Justin digging into that. Uh, so with that, I will send it over to Dan H uh, next, and then DJ Devin three will be after that. Okay. Uh Thanks to uh, Justin, who's doing a lot of rough experimentation, and thanks to everybody who kibitzed on this in Discord. Uh, and we'll talk about that more in, in the weeds. Thanks to uh, um, GitHub user Vladok, who's been looking at a number of pertinent issues, pointing out problems, and has submitted PRs, some of which they reminded us of, and I uh, reviewed. They were in other libraries, not necessarily CircuitPython. Uh, thanks to Scott for moving ahead quickly with ESP IDF 5.2.1, which fixes problems. That's really good. And thanks to Jeff for spending a lot of his time on floppy drive support, which is not CircuitPython, and yet he's dedicated to working on that as needed. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is DJ Devin, and then Jeff after that. Thank you. I have a lot of hugs this week. A uh, hug to Foamy Guy, Tactric, and Dan H for guidance on opening and closing some issues this week, as well as helping with uh, Git issues. A uh, hug to uh, Melissa, Foamy Guy, and Dan H for looking into an issue with the CircuitPython RSS feed. 
a hug to Foamy Guy for having to review 16 PRs I made to add a fruit request library this week, and he probably woke up to five more this morning. A uh, hug to whoever came up with the warning implementation for the new display bus types. It really helped transition my project from 8.0 to 9.0. Um, I don't know who came up with that idea, but it was awesome. Uh, th- a hug to Justin for all the work he's putting into updating Lint. Moving things towards rough. I know there's a lot of back-end work that has to go into something like that. And... I think everyone sees you in the in the work that you're putting in and appreciates everything that you're doing. Um, and a hug to Tanute, uh, also known as Scott here, for a great deep dive this week. Thank you for taking a look at the Electrosmith Daisy while on stream. It's an N8R65 board. Uh, and thank you, Scott, for all of your advice, including the most recent one that is I'm definitely going to look into trying to port this now. And to Katni for being around this week. It's always nice to see when she's participating and to see her pop in. That's it. All right. Thanks, DJ Devin. Uh, next up is Jeff, and then it'll be Justin after that. Oh, hey. Um, I just wanted to first give a group hug um, and then specifically mention uh, some folks who are reporting and testing on an issue filed uh, today or last night about SO reuse adder uh, not being available on the Pico W. And that's GitHub users, Studio Staff, Anic Data, and DJ Devon Three. Um, yeah, that's what I got. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Justin, and then after that will be Katni. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, just wanted to give out a hug report to DJ Devon Three for all the updating he's doing to the request examples. When I made that change to Connection Manager. I did not spend the time to kind of update all of those, and so he's been just plowing through those, which is awesome to see. Um, also, for Anc Data, for making the ESP32 um, Spy more like the other radio libraries, which is something that I'm hoping to work on as well. And then a hug to all the people that kind of helped talk to me about lynching um, over the week. That allowed me to kind of open up some PRs over the weekend, and that we'll talk about towards the end of the day. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Justin. Uh, next up is Katni, and after that will be Maker Melissa. Hello. All right. My first hug report is for you, Tim, for helping work through figuring out some weirdness on display I.O. with an e-ink display. To Scare for teaching me a bit about capacitors today. And also for offering to try to test an issue I ran into, um, but not having enough LEDs. Still, I appreciate um, that you were trying to do that. And also to Tyeth for answering a number of questions for me over the past week or so. That's what I've got. Awesome. Thanks, Katni. Next up is Maker Melissa, and then uh, Scott will finish it up, us out after that. I want to give a hug to Dan for quickly reviewing my uh, Blinka Display IO PR. To Jeff for a PR that sorts the uh, RSS feed boards. Um, he kind of went through and did the, like a huge uh, formatting on all the different boards and stuff. Uh, to get me for a nice chat last week and a uh, group hug to everyone else. All right, thanks, Melissa. And uh, next up, and rounding out the hug reports, will be Scott. Hello. Uh, for me, a hug to Paul and Todd for the bootloader show about the CircuitPython 9 release. I just listened to it on my walk into work today. Um, it's a podcast, if you don't know, <laughs> but that they do. Um, hugs to Henry Gabb and Peter Fox for the encouraging comments on the ESP BLE issue. I thought I'd highlight those because um, a lot of times when people convey that they are excited for something, they do it in a way that makes me not want to work on it by like being kind of demanding. But these two chimed in when I, I mentioned on it and actually were encouraging. So I wanted to highlight that and uh, thank them for that. Uh, lastly, thanks to Kyle Moore and uh, URE on GitHub for adding new boards to CircuitPython. All right. Thank you, Scott. And that is it for the hug reports. So next up will be status updates. Status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I'll start, and then we'll go through the list alphabetically. Uh, when I call on you, you can take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing uh, in the past week since the last meeting and what you'll be up to until the next meeting. Uh, this is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. Um, if an opportunity does, uh, excuse me, if a discussion does get 
too long for status updates, we can move it down to in the weeds to expand further. So I will get us started after I take a timestamp. There we go. Um, I have been working on updating the learn guide code and pages uh, that reference display.io stuff, in particular the 9.0 changes to the API. Uh, the code and the pages are done as of this morning. Next up is library example code, uh, which does get embedded in some guides. And I noticed there is a note about that in the weeds uh, as well. So we'll talk about that a bit more later on. Uh, I also did a bit of tinkering locally with circuitpython.org, specifically to the RSS feed to change, uh, to sort the order that the RSS feed appears in, but also to try to fix the images, which I noticed when I was testing the sort order that the images weren't rendering. Uh, it was interesting to work inside of, um, I think it's called Liquid, the templating, templating engine, uh, which is not something I'm super familiar with, but it behaves pretty similarly to one that I am. So it's always fun to dive into the .org website and play with that a bit. Um, one of the other things I've been working on is uh, RSA encryption. I've submitted a few PRs to Adafruit RSA. Um, specifically, I've been trying to work on integration between the Adafruit RSA library uh, on the back end of an HTTP server uh, running on a microcontroller like ESP32 S3, and then using JS encrypt uh, module on the front end page, which is hosted by that server. Uh, I was initially having a bit of trouble um, of this you know, square hole round peg variety because I was trying to use this JS library in a way that it wasn't really meant to uh, by trying to get rid of module importing and exporting. Uh, I did eventually give up that fight and had some success on uh, delivering the public key via cookie uh, from the server, encrypting a message with it in the front end, sending that message to the back end, and then successfully decrypting it in the back end with the private key. So that was really, really cool to see. Um, after a, a lot of failure, I finally managed to get that, which I'm super stoked about. Uh, I did start trying to integrate that with the larger project that I've been working on, which is uh, on the Cardputer device, and it's kind of a messenger project that allows different users to send messages back and forth between the handset. Uh, I started having all kinds of weird memory errors and other issues that were uh, very difficult to troubleshoot and not uh, being reliably uh, reproducible. Um, so I kind of am getting the sense that my original plans might be just too big. Uh, so I am uh, brainstorming like what parts of it I'm okay with cutting out to get down to something much less complex uh, to try to get rid of some of those issues. Um, and then the uh, other thing that I've got listed to work on this week is some e-ink display testing and to start building out a, uh, a basic tic-tac-toe game that will run on e-ink displays. Uh, and that is what I've got. Next up is uh, Dan H. And then uh, DJ Devin 3 will be after that. Okay, thanks. All right. Uh, so as everybody knows, I released uh, Circuit Python 9 final last Monday evening. Thank you to everybody who worked on that over the past year, basically. Um, I updated some guides that uh, referred to eight things that had are gone from 9.0 or, or deprecated particularly um, like using dot show in display, there was still some guides that mentioned that. And also there was some stuff in the learn guide repo in the code in there, but there was also some, just some pasted in code that needed to be fixed. And if, if you notice anything like that, just uh, note a feedback item in the guide and we'll try to get to it. Uh, and since 9.0 was released, there have been various reports of issues. Um, and so I've been investigating those and triaging them. Some of them are real, some of them are not. Um, thanks to Jeff for fixing the SO reuse adder, which was not implemented in PicoW. And there was also an interesting problem with um, pin sleep uh, support. Uh, we went to ESP IDF 513 uh, in the last few weeks of 900, and it turns out that broke pin sleep wake up, but it's fixed in 521, so it'll be fixed in 9.1 something. And so I'm also, besides fixing all these bugs and researching the bugs, I'm working on some changes for 9.1 as well, because we have plenty of issues in that milestone. All right, that's it. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is DJ Devin 3, and after that is Jeff. Well, what Scott said in the stream is relevant. You go backwards, you get bugs. You go forwards, you get bugs. 
Uh, this week, I started going through good first issues to see what I could help clean up now that 9.0 is stable and here. I've been updating a lot of my boards to 9.0 and bug hunting this week. Help test an issue with Adafruit date time from CircuitPython 7 Alpha 4. This issue was probably fixed long ago, but was left dormant. I was able to test and confirm the bug is gone in 9.0, uh, and that helped close a 967-day-old issue, which is something to be said about Git. You can just go through the good first issues, find something. Sometimes you just need to give someone a nudge that originally worked on it to revisit it, and then it, can, it just closes itself with a newer version of CircuitPython. Um, I found a bug in the CircuitPython RSS feed not updating in chronological order. Finished updating all Adafruit request Wi-Fi API examples to use Connection Manager for 9.0. I'm sorry this is so long. I've had a really busy week. Uh, I deleted the Twitter API example with permission because I couldn't get their new API to work. Their documentation is in shambles with three different API versions and none of their OAuth tutorials work easily on a microcontroller. Compare that to a submit a PR I submitted to update the YouTube API example, which was an absolute pleasure to work with because their documentation and examples are outstanding. They even have REST examples specifically designed for microcontrollers, which is the first time I've ever seen that. Uh, submitted a PR to add display rotation to the IS31FL7. 3731 CharliePlex library. It should make chaining CharliePlex matrices in any orientation much easier. And be, if you know those, you know be, they have like stemma connectors at the top so you can really only orient them in like two directions. But this way you can orient them, you can rotate it and orient them in any direction that you want. I uh, submitted a PR to update the 3.5 inch TFT Featherwing display driver with 9.0 transitional code. And I updated my Featherweather MQTT Touch project to 9.0. There were a few hiccups, like needing to update the TFT Featherwing driver. But other than that, it was a great transition, and I will be porting all of my projects to 9.0. And that's what I got. All right. Thanks to you, Devin. Uh, next up is Jeff, and after that is Justin. Hi again. Um, so I've been working this morning on updating the floppy IO module. This will be going in the main branch only. It makes incompatible API changes. And where I'm at right this second is I'm close to building it. And well, I built it. And so I'm close to testing it on hardware. Um, as a couple of folks mentioned, uh, I added a little change to add SO reuse adder support for the Pico W and other RP2040 boards with Wi-Fi. that's pending testing from one of the folks who reported the bug. Um, I've been working on a branch called SSL Anything that will allow SSL to work on WizNet sockets. And within that branch, I've added support for setsock opt. It will just call the method on the underlying socket object. And that would eventually allow removal of this workaround, uh, possibly from the uh, Adafruit HTTP server library works around setsock opt being missing, but not failing. Uh, that's, so what, that's what I'm referring to here. Um, and then the other thing I've done is I've built a little test setup on the swirly grids for the HUSB 238, which is this board for uh, USB power above 5 volts. A friend tried to make a project with HUSB 238 and saw some reliability problems. They were using a Raspberry Pi Pico, and I'm using CircuitPython and an Espresso Kitty Pi. And anyway, um, it's working for me in that I can query my power supply four million times in a row without an error. Um, but they were seeing problems after they had requested different voltages from the actual uh, USB power delivery power supply. So that is next. And the troubling thing there is it seemed like it was maybe damaging the HUSB 238 chip so that it became unreliable for just doing the scan test. So that's not fun. And I'm trying to, yeah, trying to reproduce their experiences. Um, and in non-CircuitPython stuff, uh, Dan mentioned I've been doing a lot with the floppy stuff there, which is true. That is close to done. The next thing that I will be taking a look at on that side of the fence is updating uh, Arduino support for RGB matrix on ESP family microcontrollers, uh, which turns out to be needed due to changes in the version of ESP IDF, which just has a few incompatibilities. Uh, so I'll be taking a look at that maybe later this, this week. And that's what I've got going on. All right. Thank you, Jeff. 
Uh, next up is Justin, and after that will be Katni. Yeah, pretty short and sweet this week. I uh, just spent a bunch of time playing with the rough upgrades, trying to see what kind of made sense, and talking back and forth with a lot of people on Discord to get their opinions on things, and then kind of finished up with some draft PRs over the weekend that we'll talk about later. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. And next up is Katni, and after that is Maker Melissa. Hello. So I finally got around to building my multiple grow light setups. They're now each 60 dot star LEDs, 40 cool white, and 20 RGB, wired up to an ESP32 S3. Uh, for the most part, there's one S2 involved, a feather, and a NeoPixel 8 as a level shifter. The code turns on and, on and off the LEDs based on a specific time using Adafruit.io to keep track of the time. Uh, they were working on 3D printed cases. Um, the they're mostly good to go, um, but they have magnets on the back, which is uh, super keen because the terrariums that they're in are magnetic, and so I can just stick it to the side uh, with no issues. And then uh, the last feature that I, well, I don't know about last, but the next feature I want to add is a temperature and humidity sensor, uh, which needs a um, needs its own 3D printed case because I mist the plants regularly, and I need to uh, make sure that I'm not directly misting a sensor board. Um, so the ESP32 S2 version has been running for about a year now, and it was rebooting multiple times per day. It was running 8x. Um, I noticed that the reboots have stopped since I upgraded the build and CircuitPython. However, I also learned a little over a week ago that you can't max out power supplies or you will run into issues. Issues like rebooting a microcontroller regularly, which is almost certainly what the issue was. The LED density went from about 220 down to 60, and so the power draw dropped significantly. Um, and I didn't... I. I deliberately calculated it so that it would be just under the max of the power supply, not knowing that that was not supposed to be a thing. So that's really what's been going on. Um, and then with the new setups, I ran into issues with flickering, but only on the ESP32 S3 versions. And after a lot of unnecessary shenanigans, it turns out a capacitor on the power lines fixed it. I have never in seven years of doing this added a capacitor to my LED strips, but here we are. Um, separately, I picked up a Pimeroni Badger 2040W and finally got around to starting some code for it. Uh, it was real simple code that uh, would ju it should just cause the display to refresh on a button press. I found that it would refresh on the first button press since reload, and then stop refreshing after that until the board was reloaded or reset. Uh, Foamy Guy tested things on a mag tag, and we eventually figured out that if there is no change to what is on the display, it will not refresh. So if you make it so that each button displays something different, it refreshes on every button press, but if it remains static, it doesn't refresh. Um, which seemed weird, but, uh, I, at least we figured out what was going on and it's not so much an issue because eventually the plan is for the code to, um, have it, you know, the button presses change what's on the display. So it's not as though it needs to refresh with nothing changing. Um, but my simplistic, you know, test code was, was not working properly. Um, and then, uh, very finally, belated hug report to Foamy Guy for clarifying that black and white e ink displays ba background default is black and not white, which threw me for a loop until I added a white triangle, and then also for helping me with my badge code. That's what I've got. All right. Thank you, Katni. Next up is Maker Melissa, and then I will read notes for Tectric after that. Hello. Uh, let's see. I updated Blinka Display I.O. to match the CircuitPython 9.0 uh, API. I added PWM support to Blinka for the Raspberry Pi. I updated Blinka RockPi S board to use libgpiod instead of sysfs. I added PWM support to Jet, uh, the Jetson Nano, and uh, I'm going to. I'm continuing to work on GitHub PRs, and I'm currently fixing an issue with the CircuitPython installer for Windows. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Next up, I will read some notes for Tectric, and then Scott is after that. Uh, so Tectric writes for status updates this week, uh, continuing to update CircFirm with new features. I'm hoping that in the next couple of weeks, it'll be in a more steady state. Uh, fully ready for general use. Uh, there is a link here to that GitHub project if folks would like to check it out. It looks like a command line tool for installing and updating the firmware on your CircuitPython device, which is pretty neat. 
Uh, Tectric also has here working through uh, PRs that have been tagged on or assigned. Uh, so thanks to Tectric for that. And uh, last up, rounding it out, the status updates, I will send it over to Scott. Hello. So I've got a PR to merge in fixes to the ESP32 camera library for the IDF 5.2 update. I think that's the last thing I need before I can get the IDF 5.2 update into main. Um, and then I think after that, we'll probably end up doing a 9.1 beta, maybe. Um, we'll talk to Dan. Dan's Dan manages releases generally now. Um, I wrote that I was, uh, for the USB host Featherwing support, I was waiting on work from TAC, but I, I, after I wrote that down, I saw that he actually merged it in. So I will try to get back to USB host Featherwing in the next day or two. Um, and then uh, I'm getting back into, after... USB host Featherwing stuff is kind of either out for review or back to tack. I'll then get back to the ESP BLE support. That's kind of the next big, big work item for me um, that I'm I'm anxious to do because I, I like I'm a huge fan of the S3 and that is a pretty big gap in what we support on the S3. So yeah, that's me. All right, thank you, Scott. And that is it for status updates. So next up and uh, last section for the meeting is In the Weeds. As a reminder, In the Weeds is an opportunity for long-form discussions. They can either come out of status updates or be identified ahead of time. Uh, if you know that you've got an In the Weeds topic that you'd like to discuss, please uh, go ahead and make sure to add it down at the bottom of the notes doc now. We've got a couple others, so we will start on those. And first up is... Uh, a topic from DJ Devin. You want to share your topic, DJ Devin? Uh, thank you, yes. Uh, I have two uh, In the Weeds topics. Uh, I've been pretty busy this week, so I've come across a lot of things. Um, first, the good first issues are littered with typing issues, and there's a lack of information about the types. And at first, typing was very basic with string and float types, but now as we become more complicated with bus types and many more other types um, that I'm not even aware of. Uh, with documentation listing the different types possible, uh, without documentation listing the different types possible, in my opinion, typing issues are not within the realm of good first issues for beginners anymore. Tetric is taking on updating the typing repo with some examples, and I'd like to see more documentation on typing become beginner friendly again as it's becoming more infused with CircuitPython development workflow. And um, that's open for discussion. Although I know Tetric is has already taken that on and is hard at work. I just wanted to bring that up as being kind of like a breaking thing for beginners to, to take on good first issues. Is it? Yeah, I would. And uh, as Dan writes here as well, um, that we would want, we do want to remove the tricky typing ones from good first issues. And I think we did do a pass on that at one point, um, but it sounds like it's probably time to do that again. I do you think that is the basically it for the good first issues the last couple of times that I've looked through them? It hasn't been necessarily this week or last week, um, but the last time I went through them, I think this was basically the bulk of them. So it, I will say uh, we could go through and remove them. I definitely agree that the ones that are left are probably not so much good first issues at this point because all of the uh, all of the easy ones have thankfully been uh, been knocked out, honestly. So. Um, we could remove those. I would kind of caution that basically will leave us with none. Um, I think it would be good if we can maybe try to identify something else that maybe is a good first issue. I'd, I would love to have something to be able to point folks towards who do want to get involved but don't have as much um, experience. So that would be one of my takeaways from that topic is maybe we could try to brainstorm as a group what might make good first issues to add after we remove these. Um, but yeah, I would say maybe we should plan on going through and removing all the ones that are left unless like we happen to see any that are actually super duper easy. Um, although I doubt that there are gonna be any that are really in that column left at this point. So I, I know that there are 33 good first issues in all the repos right now. Another thing that I'd like to bring up, maybe I'm misunderstanding good first issues with good beginner issues. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, it was always my assumption that good first issues were supposed to be like beginner friendly. Uh, yeah, no, I don't. I think that's correct. Yeah, I look at at, at them as the same. Basically, good first issue, good beginner issue. I I feel are essentially the same. Yeah, and PyCon did knock out a lot of them because <laughs> I was I was working on some from PyCon, and like somebody at PyCon would knock one out as I was working on one. That that was actually pretty cool. Okay, so it sounds like um, the action item there is go through the list, remove any that don't make sense, which is probably going to be all of them at this point. Um, and then we can maybe try to brainstorm some or um, maybe eventually try to rework our wording during the meeting or the filters on the site and stuff. I just worry it will be a little bit awkward if we are sitting at zero for too long, um, if we're still saying stuff like that each week in the meeting and having the filter on the site and stuff. So, Well, I like the, uh, the typing issues. Um, as long as there's documentation to support that, then a beginner can go in. And I still honestly consider myself a beginner, so I can right. go in. I mean, I think and the problem is... As long is, as I know all the types. Yeah, I think that, well, so I mean, one problem is it, it, it's difficult or impossible to actually have a comprehensive list of types because some libraries could create their own class and then the types used in that library could be that class. And so um, it would be difficult or impossible to really have a super comprehensive list of every possible type, I think. We definitely should have a list of all the common ones though, like a string and int and number, all the super basic ones that are not customized. Plus, I do think the documentation being added into CircuitPython typing, all the custom ones that we have created that you, uh, I think, mentioned Tectric looking into, those I think would be super beneficial as well. But I, I would caution, I don't necessarily think we can get to a world where there is actually just one big comprehensive list that could, pos that could have every possible type that any library would need. Um, that, and then the other thing I would just add is the typing issues that remain, I think, are just not good first issues at all, really. Uh, e even if we had better documentation, I think the ones that are left are actually on the much harder side of things. So um, even if we did bring that documentation up to date, I still don't think that they probably make great candidates for a good first issue at this point the uh the the large majority of them when we first started doing it when you know we still had lots of driver libraries that were only a few lines of code and it was like typing you know two or three functions and an initializer or something like that i think those um fit the good first issue label a lot more closely than what's left now which are some of the more advanced libraries that have many files and many functions and many different things that need um need doing so Yeah, my experience having been at two PyCons where the main source of, quote, good first issues was typing issues is that um, people really struggled with them. There was the fact that every, most of the things remaining are hard. Like one of them is a matrix portal or something. And the, the types in matrix portal are kind of complicated. Um, but also, I don't think that typing is for beginners. You know, beginners have a may have an intuitive grasp of it makes sense to add two numbers but not a number and a string, but it's like not something that they would have necessarily encountered by now. So just based on my experience of, of being at PyCon and trying to offer these to people who were interested in contributing and people were right there in the room to help them was it didn't go that well. And I don't think there's like one unifying kind of good first issue that we can create 300 of again. I think adding typing to the easy cases was unique in that respect. It probably needs somebody to look at the open issues and say, and think about it and say, I bet this would be tractable for a beginner. Um, not create one new issue in each GitHub repo um, that is potentially a good first issue based on some idea we have because you know like change this code until it makes pilot happy is not a great first issue um because it's not a good first issue should also be fun to to work on and i i felt like the typing issues were not 
were not fun. They didn't offer a benefit. It's not. It does something now that it didn't do before. So maybe maybe I'm a little negative on typing overall, but I just the experience of being at PyCon and trying to help people work with this uh, was was not the best. I, I wish it could have been better. So I, I'm going to go through the since I have the search open, I'll just go through and remove good first issue of most of these. Cool, and we can keep an eye out um, for other good first issues, kind of like um, organic issues that exist that might be good. So if anybody happens to be filing issues or seeing issues pop up that makes sense, um, this would just be the reminder. If you see those go by and they look like they are fitting in this mold of relatively basic, and um, I think what Jeff brings up is a really good point as well, like uh, I'll call it fulfilling uh, whatever the change is. This is something that's that's interesting that could actually grab the uh, the attention of somebody. Um, do feel free to either add that label if you've got the capability to do so, or if you don't have access, uh, I don't know what rights that requires in GitHub or whatever, but if you uh, just leave a note in CircuitPython dev, somebody can definitely get to it if you're not able to. So uh, keep an eye out for those. Right. Um, There's also, most of them were also labeled with Hacktoberfest, and I think I'll probably take that away also. Yep. Yeah, and the Hacktoberfest, we eventually, I think the first time we did it, we had it to where they were applied, it was applied to individual issues, and then after that first time, I believe we changed it to where it's like tagged on the repo somehow now. I don't know, I don't recall if it's a tag or a category or what, but there's like a, a repo level thing that controls that as well, so okay. that can definitely I'll, I'll be removed I'll from the like, issues. And I'm not bothering, the ones that are closed already, I'm not going to bother to fiddle with, so yeah. obviously. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Uh, does anybody else have anything to add on typing or good first issue front? Or uh, if not, I'll um, pass over DJ Devon for the next item. Okay. Uh, I ran into some display drivers not being updated in time for 9.0. If the 3.5 inch TFT Featherwing wasn't updated with at least transitional code, it makes me wonder what other displays uh, drivers aren't 9.0 ready as well. Uh, so I'm sure that's probably something that you Adafruit folks are going through the process of looking into. Um, and it, maybe I just came across one that hadn't been updated yet, or maybe there's many of them. I don't know. Uh, but it's something that I would like to bring up and bring your attention to. I just I think if you just open an issue, that'd be great. I, I tried. It was with me, retired wizard, maybe Justin. I can't remember who were working on these. And we thought we had most of them. We shouldn't, we should, we haven't stopped building 8x bundles yet, 8.x bundles. So we need to not remove the transitional code and convert it to 9.0 only code yet. So any I code thought any that's what I was doing. Should be, should be work for both 8 and 9. Yeah, I, I, fix the driver like i can go in and fix the driver and then submit a new one it's just i don't know which other ones might exist that i might have to do that i i i did a i grew through all the bundle and i tried to find them all and obviously we missed some so oh uh, okay i got it okay no problem. It wasn't, it was, it's, it's like it was an imperfect uh sur survey or something I'm yeah tetra left a comment he was like nice fine and i was like okay well that's promising you know that that i found one that needed to be fixed yeah, I know we did this like several months ago, but we obviously missed some. So. Yeah. And I know there are a couple of examples in that state as well that I ran across this morning while I was looking at Learn Guides. The Learn Guides can embed code either from the Learn repo or from the library examples inside of the library repos. Uh, I did see a couple. I think all the ones I saw today had the transitional code, so it had both support for 8 and 9, so it sounds like we want to leave those alone for now. Um, but I do have a search pulled up here in my terminal as well to go through that list and see if there are, I can check and see if there are any that are not transitional that actually have only the old one. If there are, I can submit ERs for those. But I, the, looking at the full list, including even the ones that are transitional, it's not super long. So I don't necessarily think there are going to be a whole lot of these that got missed at this point. So, um, and then yeah, if we... Of display, there were an amazing number of display 
repos, actually. Yeah, yeah, the drivers, a there's a lots of them. Yeah. Um, let's see. Jepler mentioned the the circup warning from SSD. Is that the same one or a different one? Or did... Oh, well, okay, yeah, I guess we don't know for sure. DJ Devin mentioned the feather 3.5 inch feather wing. I'm not sure if that's SSD 1306 or a different one. So it sounds like maybe there are two. Um, but I've got yeah, the, there, uh, there are two. The 3.5 inch is has two versions one is the hx8357 and then uh, yeah the other one foamy guy probably knows yeah i've got the full list of them grepped here in my background to go through later on this afternoon so i will uh i will submit pr also the there's the, remaining. like the, the 2.3 inch T uh, tft feather wing which i haven't uh i haven't checked out yet okay cool yeah my uh my grep should find anything in the in the bundle so and then definitely i would say too feel free to open uh like i was mentioned before feel free to open it, uh, issues on any that you do find um all right anybody uh, else have thoughts or discussion on displays or updates to display io driver api type stuff going once going twice all right I will hand it over to uh, Justin next for the next topic. Great, thanks. Um, so long story short, so I updated a bunch of stuff in Connection Manager and then requests. I'm a long time user of like iSort, so I had started by making some PRs to potentially update iSort um, in the cookie cutter, um, which you know spiraled into a bunch of other things and then potentially changing to rough because it's faster and different things like that, um, which will reduce build time and things. So, um, you know, basically based on feedback, um, I got a couple um, libraries that might be good to run it through. And I basically ran all of those libraries through the same set of um, commits, um, just so we can basically see what each one did. So that the formatter first, and then I sort, and then lint. And then I did um, the upgrade, and I blocked off any number that they, anything needed, um, anything that would change code. And then I brought those up over the weekend. And so then I kind of removed a couple of them that Dan had mentioned um, would be, you know, good to follow those rules as well. Um, and then I finished up by adding um, the badge in the readme just to kind of make things um, similar. Because obviously if we're not using black, we wouldn't want that badge. Um, and so for me personally, um, like, things I liked on it. So there's a lot of comments that get removed um, from the pilot stuff. The mass majority of the changes for everything happen in examples, just because typically the examples I see are made from other people, right? That they build out an example, like DigiJub and 3, for example. And like, this is to me where things like I sort and formatting things come in handy because then it helps everybody kind of have the same type of code. So when I picked a couple other random libraries, just looking at stuff, the more examples they had, the more, you know, those were where the bulk of the changes were. Um, so kind of at this point, it, the ball's back in, you know, the Adafruit court to kind of figure out what they want to do. I'm happy to help. However, um, I know there was talk last week of doing commits directly to main, which I know I don't have privileges to do and such. And I know, um, other than Tectric, most of the people here, if, I don't know if they want to go in depth on the comments they made um, to further down or kind of where we think next steps or how we'd want to go about the next bits. Yeah, I'll read, uh, I'll read Tectric's comment who's not here. Tectric uh, wrote here in the notes doc, I think these great uh, change, I think these are great changes. Uh, whenever it's time to bring these changes over to the rest of the libraries, I can help with the Adabot patch. Can use one of the draft PRs to see how complicated it would be to patch, i.e. can Adabot do it herself or will we need some um, extended tooling or some other scripts that will be available to do it for us um, in a more customized way. Uh, uh, Tectric also says I'll handle flagging libraries that need work afterwards with issues. Um, well, that's all good stuff and sounds like um, at least one person who's interested in helping take the next steps as well. Um, Dan has a question here, which I think is definitely a good question. Is it uh, Effectively, it looks like it boils down to, is it possible to put the rough settings inside of a separate file from pyproject.toml? Can that go into like a rough.toml or 
something that is specific to that. That way, anytime if we would want to make a change to that, it would be easier to patch since it would be on its own in a file, which presumably will end up being identical across all the repos, whereas PyProject will, of course, differ um, due to the different names and project repo locations and all that kind of stuff. It's like mostly formulaic, but still different. So if that can have a separate one, um, I would agree with the gist of what's written here is that basically that would be probably the preferable way to do it. Do you happen to know, Justin, if um, Rough can work that way or is it only pyproject.toml? No, it is. Yeah, so that's a statement. Can you oh, can sorry. Okay, that's not a question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in favor of that then because I do think it will make it much easier if and when the time comes to make changes to that. Yeah, and I'm a Pi Project type of person, so that's typically where I put all my settings, just because it's one spot. But definitely for you guys, since you have it across all the libraries, having that separate totally makes sense. Um, answering the other part of that, you could also have it in one of your other building libraries and have it use that every time. And then if that one changes, you'd open your PR and it would fail, at which point it would probably tell you, oh, you should probably go update your rough settings local, you know, in your PR to fix it. So that would be a choice whether or not that made sense for you guys, right? So, you know, kind of like the thing that failed, the totally different project. Um, I forget actually the project that was on that I helped track down, like the old issue. Like you could do that with both requirements and like the rough and things like that. And so tests, whenever they ran, always ran with a very specific version. And then if you had failures, it would help let you let the individual opening the PR know that their stuff was out of date. Um, sure. You can create a, a rule to check that and have it fail to tell you, hey, before you can open a PR, you actually have to go, this stuff needs to get updated first. So the question I had was, I mean, we have cases, Tetric did this, he factored out a bunch of things into a common repo, which is pretty tricky to do, actually. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't work in all cases. So the question is, could there be a common rough.toml which is referenced when you use pre-commit locally, not when you submit the PR? And I'm not sure how to do that because can you set up the pre-commit install, for instance, so it fetches, it, 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 you know, maybe it's not a good idea, but, uh, in other words, I, I want rough.toml to be a pointer to a factored out common rough.toml in, in the default case. Yeah, so you could do that uh, typically. So when I've done things like that in the past, you run pre-commit with local installs. And so you would have rough potentially be a requirement. And so when you run it, you can run it yourself. And that way, that pre-commit thing could actually have a another pre-step. So it's kind of... It's almost like a pre-commit wrapper around rough that would do that download each time and things. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if someone's yeah. trying to do some level work offline and then they like can't pre-commit, you know, can't check their code because they're not online or whatnot, if that's a good thing or a bad thing. So maybe I'll ask Tetrick about this when they're online again. Yeah. About whether it's because be I know cool. we've done this factoring out before, but it's mostly in terms of the CI yeah, the rather than stuff. Than that would be super convenient, though. I, I will um, give a plus plus one to that on my end. If it could, if that rough.toml could live in either the the action CI library repo or a separate new repo that's like a centralized place for it, that way it could be downloaded before it runs, and then when and if there is a change to it, it's even easier than an Adabot patch because then it's actually just go change it in one place and all the rest of everything. I mean, um, it goes, kind of goes against, without it being a sub-module, it kind of goes against the philosophy of Git. Yeah. Is that your snapshot is your snapshot and it doesn't have external dependencies. Yeah. But... Um, I think I, I would that. mention that the... Um, I don't necessarily look at it as a huge deal breaker if offline local pre-commit no longer works because I think pre-commit if you hadn't run it before it's trying to install stuff anyway so like un unless you've already done some setup I don't think offline is going to work 
any way. But it's really easy to say pre-commit and install. I do that all the time so that I, I avoid unnecessary commits. I mean, that's the whole point is that it's pre-commit. Right. So. Um, right. Yeah, I just so, I th yeah. think there's several steps there that won't that that will be trying to use the network for various stuff. So if we if we were to decide to try to centralize that, um, and then it's a deal breaker for folks who are offline because they can't download that config file personally, I don't think that's a reason necessarily not to do it. I think still the benefits outweigh that, but. Yeah. Yeah, I think it depends how the user works, right? So yeah. for me, like through the request library, once I've set up pre-commit once, I can now do hundreds of commits without having to actually down, like re-download that cache and everything like that. So, um, and I often work off offline, but that's just me and I'm not, so it could be a blocker for some people, may not be. Right. Um, I think also like anyone in the know can also go grab that file separately and copy paste it in to make their thing work locally as well. It's not a like literally can't do it. No, no nothing whatsoever will make it work. It's just a doesn't work in the default case. Mm -hmm. So maybe I don't know. Tetrick and I will have a discussion about this when we're all. I don't know if it's related or not, but I've been having, the, still having the CRLF issue. Is there a way that with GitHub Actions, when something is submitted that has CRLF line endings, that it automatically converts to LF so that it won't complain? Yes. Yeah. So that was one of the things I actually put into my pull request. So there's a, you can have a dot .git attributes where you can define like text files, like what line item you want to have on commit, and it actually it'll supersede whatever random settings a user could have. So when you want to guarantee that no matter what, everybody always commits with just regular line feeds because you know you're working in a mixed environment or with, you know, people that might have different settings, um, it'll disregard whatever you set up as your global things, right? So it's global, you can set per repository, and then you can set it in the repository so they, they waterfall down. So with Git attributes, it will override whatever rent whatever setting the user would do so i would have high hopes that that particular file also gets included when whatever we do for rough because that way when you do commits and things like that it changes all the files and that way everything gets back to sync to where it's supposed to be yeah so so, i think because you you ran into those issues i've made sure to Put that one in there for discussion yeah. for people. To oh, I ran into one. hundreds of thousands of those issues. Yeah, so I think not uh, not directly related to rough, but in the same PR where we were testing rough uh, is the fix. Yeah, Thanks for that. Um, Scott did ask, are there any friendlier names for the checks? Uh, there's an example here, like UP zero twenty eight and. Um, Scott mentioned that PyLint has both. So like for folks that don't know in PyLint, uh, every particular PyLint rule has a specific name. It's given some ID. I don't know uh, off the top of my head any of the IDs, but it's something formulaic like, formulaic like this with a couple letters and numbers. But every rule also has kind of like a more human readable name where it will say something like, you know, consider F strings, um, which is much more like actual words that you can make sense of. Um, so the question is effectively, does Ruff have both of those types of names as well? The the ID sort of computer legible one that doesn't mean anything to the person, and then also the human readable one that actually is a bit descriptive and tells you what it is. Uh, Tectric has mentioned in here, I don't believe so, and linked to an issue over on Ruff. Uh, so it sounds like not yet, but maybe they uh, have it kind of in the right it's a it, it's an it's an open it's an open issue to add it so i just subscribed to it and said okay like we could switch to it once it's, it's supported yeah. like i'm not the first person and, to bring this up yeah and i don't know scott if you looked at my prs i actually i wrote both so i did the noqua on the number but then I actually wrote it out so anyone looking at the code would see what it actually was um it's definitely a lot wordier at that point um you know but yeah we could search and replace at whatever point and require okay. or ask users to do whatever method they wanted. So that, Yeah, that's fine with me. I wouldn't block it. I just wish they had added it already. Yep. All right. Anybody have any other thoughts or discussion on uh, Ruff? I have 
Uh, I can only speak for myself on the PRs. I saw those PRs go in. I haven't had a chance to take a look at them yet. So I've still got a couple of things in my stack before I do it, but I am hoping to take a peek at some of them this week uh, and leave my thoughts there. But uh, now's the time if anyone else has thoughts. Otherwise, we will get started wrapping it up. I guess I'll just end with real quick. I'm kind of at a standstill, so I'll work on other things at the point that there's things I can help on this. Just please at me wherever, and I'm happy. You know, I'm happy to do whatever work and digging into things that I can. So, yeah, Justin, I think I think your next step is to work with Tactric because we at least paid Tactric for this work for a while. So, uh, if he's talking with you about it, he that may mean he has time to do it right now. So, I'd say work okay. with Tactric on it. Okay, perfect. All right, so with that, I will wrap us up. This has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for March 25th, 2024. Thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, as a reminder, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop over at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be made available on major podcast services. Uh, it will also get featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which you can find at adafruitdaily.com if you'd like to subscribe to that. Uh, the next meeting uh, is going to be held at the normally scheduled time on Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time. That's on uh April 1st, so it is uh, not an April Fool's joke. Our meeting will be on next Monday at the normal time. Um, that, as always, is held here on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join by going to adafru.it slash discord. Uh, if you'd like to be notified about the meetings as well as any changes to the day or time, uh, again, just ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord, and we'll send out updates to that role. Uh, and that is all for this week. Thanks to everyone, and we will see you next week.